concept of the bill is to simply have the banks create the money and spend it into circulation to build the infrastructure for the state. This proposal is currently working its way through the Minnesota legislature with several bankers as sponsors. Actually, the state-owned bank idea is nothing new. The Bank of North Dakota is the only state-owned bank in America. It was created in 1919 as a populist movement swept through the debt-ridden farmers of the Northern Plains. Even in these worst of times, the Bank of North Dakota is earning record profits and helping fund their state. It's been doing this for the last 90 years, hardly a radical startup idea. According to the bank's president, Eric Hardmeyer, We are the depository for all state tax collections and fees. We plow those deposits back into the state in the form of low interest loans. Over the last 10 to 12 years, we've turned back a third of a billion dollars just to general fund to offset taxes or to aid in funding public sector needs. Not bad for a state with a population of 600,000. In 2009, the state of North Dakota does not have any funding issues at all. We, in fact, are dealing with the largest surplus we've ever had. Interestingly, the Bank of North Dakota idea was initiated by a group of Swedish immigrants to North Dakota in the early 1900s. Community banking had been going on in Sweden for at least a century before that. Around 1820, the Swedes came up with the idea of the savings bank. These full reserve banks only lent out money they actually had. They decentralized the money power and were encouraged by the government as a way for municipalities to fight poverty. These operated on what was known as the church steeple principle, where the bank could only make loans to customers whose houses could be seen from the highest church steeple in town. These community banks increased the common wealth instead of the big banker's wealth. This helped Sweden grow rich, which helped Stockholm to grow into the magnificent Venice of Scandinavia that we see here today. But then the debt-based bankers attacked the savings banks. They first convinced most of them to consolidate into bigger and bigger banks. Then the Swedish parliament was convinced to pass a law allowing the non-profit savings banks to be bought up by the commercial banks. After a series of mergers, these banks are now called Swedbank. They were under a severe attack during the 80s, but uh, many of the saving banks still remain in the country. And they are very effective, and especially because they decentralize the power and give it back into the hands of uh, the citizens. They empower the local communities. And in times of crisis, they have proven, proven to be more profitable and, uh, than the big banks. Now, there are only about 50 savings banks left a small remnant of a great idea for publicly owned banking that shows that communities or even nations can operate debt-free. Iceland's tiny economy and sparse resources were also nurtured by a series of public interest savings banks. Despite a population of a little over 300,000 people and a gross domestic product of around only $12 billion, Iceland is one of the most civilized nations on earth. But then the government privatized the savings banks, similar to the Swedish savings banks 20 years earlier. But in Iceland's case, even the Landsbanken, which essentially was the Bank of Iceland, was privatized as well. For the first few years, things looked good. The economy doubled. But under the surface, the private bankers were creating a huge financial bubble. They opened a new offshore internet bank called iSave, targeting depositors in the UK and Holland by offering attractive interest rates for new depositors. Hundreds of thousands of new accounts were opened. Entire towns and police department pension funds put their money into iSave, as did charities such as cancer relief funds. Using fractional reserve lending, iSave fanned that into billions for questionable new loans. 
iSAVE started investing in European ventures, especially in Russia. Many now believe that iSAVE actually became a money laundering operation for the Russian Mafia. All the while trading on the good reputation for solid banking Iceland had built up over the previous decades. However, when a bank was privatized, it, it still used the good reputation of Iceland to grow huge and do you know, lots of criminal activities. And the owner, Björkur Thor, uh, he became one of the rich boys in the world really quickly, one of the billionaires. I've seen documents linking him uh, to the Russian mafia and his father. One oligarch that fled to the UK confirmed that Iceland was used as a money laundering machine for the Russian Mafia. When the crash came in 2008, the big Icelandic banks quickly failed. In the five years time they, they were privatized before the collapse, they actually grew ten times uh, the Icelandic GDP. And when it collapsed, you can imagine how huge the collapse was because uh, they collapsed onto the shoulders of the nation or the taxpayers. The Icelandic parliament at first poured enormous amounts of taxpayer money into them to try to save them, but they still failed. Then the government bailed out all the Icelandic depositors, but the iSAVE accounts were not in Iceland and were never insured by the Icelandic government, and so they were not bailed out. However, in the face of tremendous political pressure at home, the British and Dutch governments bailed out the iSAVE accounts of their citizens and then tried to make Iceland pay for it at terms that have decimated Iceland's fragile economy. The income tax of more than half of the nation, just the interest of this particular loan. Then you have other loans than, you know, the we were only we have would have gotten from in 2007 being the most developed nation in the world into a nation spending all its GDP just paying interest to foreign loans. Inflation shot up. Icelanders soon discovered that even the principal on their home mortgage loans was indexed to inflation. Many Icelanders saw the principal on their home mortgages double and their payments triple. This despite rising unemployment. The way the loan system is in Iceland is completely outrageous. I mean, it is your right as a consumer are zero. Foreclosures mounted and the citizens rioted. They call it their revolution. They stormed the Parliament Square. The president was forced to call for a referendum. 93% of the people voted not to bail out the bankers. The Brits aren't exactly a shining light here about how to handle international relations. I, this, this no, it's a, not, no, no, it's one of the worst conducted, most absurd things I've seen in a long time, really. I mean, it's obvious that the Icelandics cannot afford to pay this money back. What we've just seen is the first anti-bailout tax revolt here. Now the ruling party is trying to convince Iceland to join the European Union to be eligible for loans to save its economy. The people, however, seem unconvinced that more and more debt is the solution. Iceland now seems determined to take back their money power and not take on more national debt. What I want to implement here is a healthy banking system where you don't have fractional reserve, you don't have high interest, the bank should not serve as ma mafia outlets. It should be something that is important for the communities. Over 70 percent of Iceland now opposes joining the EU and some are now supporting proposals for cities to start up savings banks based on the Bank of North Dakota model to provide local credit and stop the rising wave of housing foreclosures. We're not part of EU. Yet they are trying to put us in it uh, with 70% uh, of Icelanders don't want to join the EU, but uh, the Social Democrats are in power and that is their sole mission to get Iceland into the EU. Iceland is proud of its democratic heritage. Iceland is the home of the oldest parliament in Europe, having met annually for over 1,000 years. For the first 800 years, the Icelandic parliament met at this site where the North American tectonic plate meets the European plate. 
called Think Pedlish. Icelanders consider this a holy site where elected government was born. Today, Iceland is the new battleground as it attempts to become the first nation in modern times to escape the serfdom of the debt money system. If Iceland escapes, the rest of the world will be watching. If you end up paying this money, entering into the EU to try to find salvation that way, it will only get worse. The thing, what, what has happened in Iceland is going to happen on a worldwide scale in our lifetime. There won't be enough money to cover all the debts. Why are governments pumping money into private banks? Why are they not letting them roll? I mean, just like any other. And then the excuse is, oh, they're too big to fail. <laughs> Let them fail, please. So what this all boils down to is whether America, still the freest nation in history, will once again break free of the privately owned central bank as it has six times in the past. Our money is not issued by the government, even though they make it look like it is. It doesn't have to be this way. This system has got to go. Some will say, well, those crooks in Congress will create too much money once they get the money power. But Congress now creates all the money at once. It just creates it as debt, which never gets paid back, and which we, the people, have to continually pay interest on. Instead of creating bonds or debt, the government could and should be creating dollars, interest-free. Even though the federal government is out there borrowing and spending, $3 trillion, 10% of GDP, 9.4, something like that, over the last two years. Even though they've done that, the total amount of debt outstanding in the system since the beginning of 2008 is actually contracted, including the federal government. Now that comes directly off the Federal Reserve Zone Z1. Okay? You cannot grow an economy in a debt-based monetary system for real when the outstanding credit is, going, is becoming smaller. It can't be done because all money is debt in one form or another. But more importantly, the Treasury could solve this. Treasury has authority to issue non-debt-backed currency. They do it every day, and, and the quarters that are in your pocket are not debt-backed. As the inventor of the electric light, Thomas Edison, put it, if our nation can issue a dollar bond, it can issue a dollar bill. Both are promises to pay but one promise fattens the users and the other helps the people. Edison was friends with carmaker Henry Ford. Ford understood how the monetary system depended on keeping the average American confused. It is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Under this system, we can never get out of debt. It's just impossible. Nor is gold-backed money the solution. That was the most important symbol in the Wizard of Oz. You think international manipulation is easy now? Just wait until we return to a gold money system. As Thomas Edison told the New York Times, Gold and money are separate things. Gold is the trick mechanism by which you can control money. That is the root of all evil. The solution is government-issued money. That's the most democratic form of money system. It maximizes freedom in a republic instead of the centralized control of the international plutocracy we are rapidly devolving into. But be prepared to deal with the modern-day gold bugs. Their arguments divert us from the real question. They say that this, this money that is created by the state or by society or whatever, is not real money. Right. Uh, that it, it may represent real money, but it isn't real money. It's not what backs our money. It's who controls its quantity. That's what The Wizard of Oz was all about. Big bankers were controlling the quantity of American money, gold money. Others would say Congress isn't responsive to the people as it is. Well, of course not. Politicians are responsive to those with the power. Right now, the banks have the power. We have to take back the ultimate power of any nation, the power over its money. With the power of banks diminished, politicians will become responsive to the voters once again.
If we value the Founding Fathers' dream of freedom and escape from serfdom by political self-determination, we...